in a tacit form. Only 20% of the valuable knowledge that we possess is in an explicit form and can be easily expressed. That is why we have practical learning. Because when we learn only through words and speech, the teachers are able to pass on only 20% of all the knowledge that they possess. By observing them, we can gain even more knowledge. It is exactly like an iceberg. From outside, only the tip is visible, but there's a lot more hidden underneath. Tacit knowledge has another strength. It is really difficult for competitors to imitate. And hence, one who possesses tacit knowledge stands to gain a competitive advantage. Let me give you an example. Sir Henry Bessemer invented the advanced steel making process, and he sold this patent to five steel producers. But some of them sued him back because they were not able to get this process to work, and they felt that he had cheated them. But the truth was that they only possessed the, ex ex the explicit knowledge to get this to work. They did not possess the tacit knowledge. This, this also brings into light another fact. While science is about knowing why, and social networking is about knowing who, tacit knowledge is about knowing how. So Sir Henry Bessemer himself set up a steel company. And this steel company became one of the largest in the world and changed the whole face of steel making. Now imagine an organization where somebody has been working for a long time. He has gained a lot of experience over these years in the form of tacit knowledge. But once he leaves, if he does not share this tacit knowledge, it gets lost within himself, destroyed forever. And that brings us to the last part of this discussion. How do we share tacit knowledge? According to research, the easiest way to spread tacit knowledge is through face-to-face -face interaction. And that is why we need to talk to the tacit knowledge keepers in our group. They are usually the most experienced and the oldest. We also need to arrange for opportunities to observe these individuals and apprentice with them. Let me give an example. In 1985, Machu Shita were working on the automatic bread-making machine, but this hit an early snag. They were not able to get the bread to knead properly, and often the bread was burned on the sides. So Ikuko Tanaka, one of the software engineers, volunteered at the Osaka International Hotel, which was reputed to make the best bread in the region. So during this apprenticeship, one day she noticed that the head baker not just kneaded the dough, but also twisted and stretched it during the same time. And this was a secret to make good bread. So coming back to Matsushita, the, the software engineers worked for one full year, and they were able to get this twisting stretch into the prototype. So now, another easy way, but often overlooked method of transferring tacit knowledge is using metaphors. We have all read the Panchatantras and the Aesop's fables when we were young. But over years, we forget. We think of them as mere stories, but they hide behind them huge storage of wisdom. We too can use metaphors and allegories to spread tacit knowledge. We need to move beyond this two-dimensional transfer of explicit knowledge and increase the amount of meaningful conversation amongst our groups. We need, to, we need to focus more on knowledge rather than data and information, and only then are we focusing on the future rather than the past. Thank you. We shall now play a TED Talk video. Please sit back and enjoy. Imagine a big explosion as you climb through 3,000 feet. Imagine a plane full of smoke. Imagine an engine going clack, 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 clack. Sounds scary. Well, I had a unique seat that day. I was sitting in 1D. I was the only one who could talk to the flight attendants. So I looked at them right away, and they said, no problem, we probably hit some birds. The pilot had already turned the plane around, and we weren't that far. You could see Manhattan. Two minutes later, 
three things happen at the same time. The pilot lines up the plane with the Hudson River. It's usually not the route. <laughs> he turns off the engines. Now imagine being on a plane with no sound. And then he says three words, as unemotional three words as I've ever heard. He says, brace for impact. I didn't have to talk to the flight attendant anymore. <laughs> I could see in her eyes. It was terror. Life was over. And I want to share with you three things I learned about myself that day. I learned that it all changes in an instant. We have this bucket list. We have these things we want to do in life. And I thought about all the people I wanted to reach out that I didn't. All the fences I wanted to mend. All the experiences I wanted to have and I never did. As I thought about that, later on I came up with a saying, which is, I collect bad wines. Because if the wine is ready and the person is there, I'm opening it. I no longer want to postpone anything in life. And that urgency, that purpose, has really changed my life. The second thing I learned that day, and this is as we um, clear the George Washington Bridge, which was by not a lot. <laughs> I thought about, wow, I really feel one real regret. I've lived a good life. In my own humanity and mistakes, I've tried to get better at everything I've tried. But in my humanity, I also allow my ego to get in. And I regretted the time I wasted in things that did not matter with people that matter. And I thought about my relationship with my wife, with my friends, with people. And after, as I reflected on that, I decided to eliminate negative energy from my life. It's not perfect. It's a lot better. I've not had a fight with my wife in two years. It feels great. I'm no longer trying to be right. I choose to be happy. The third thing I learned, and this is as your mental clock starts going 15, 14, 13, you can see the water coming. I'm saying, please blow up. Right? I don't want this thing to break in 20 pieces like you've seen in those documentaries. And as we're coming down, I had a sense of, wow, dying is not scary. It's almost like we've been preparing for it our whole lives. But it was very sad. I didn't want to go. I love my life. And that sadness really framed in one thought, which is, I only wish for one thing. I only wish I could see my kids grow up. About a month later, I was in a performance by my daughter, first grader, not much artistic talent, <laughs> yet. <laughs> and I'm bawling, I'm crying like a little kid. And it made all the sense in the world to me. I realized at that point, by connecting those two dots, that the only thing that matters in my life is being a great dad. Above all, above all, the only goal I have in life is to be a good dad. I was given the gift of a miracle of not dying that day. I was given another gift, which was to be able to see into the future and come back and live differently. I challenge you guys that are flying today, imagine the same thing happens on your plane, and please don't. But imagine, and how would you change? What would you get done that you're waiting to get done because you think you'll be here forever? How would you change your relationships and the negative energy in them? And more than anything, are you being the best parent you can? Thank you. Influence in the UAE, a TEDx speaker and the winner of the Masala Awards 2017 for the most inspirational personality. Please welcome onto the stage our next keynote speaker, Mr. Sujit Varghese. He has been a sports person, an ardent boxer and an avid racer. We are sure that his talk will give you a new perspective towards life. Everyone, now there are some news that none of us are prepared to hear. I certainly wasn't when I heard one such news a couple of years ago. My name is Sujit Koshi Vargas. I'm born and raised in the UAE. I did most of my schooling here. I was li I'm living with my parents. Dubai life is something I could uh, describe as a very routine life. A couple of years later, I moved to Bangalore to pursue my university. I was 20 at that time. Friends, bikes, parties, you name it, I had it. It was all there. Life was nothing short than a constant vacation. 
and ever since school i was always active in the field of sports i started off playing in the basketball team for my in my high school years and uh, during my college years i got introduced to the world of boxing in which i took an immediate liking towards it gave me a sense of focus and discipline i needed so basically at that age 20 i felt like i had it all and i was living a life that every guy wanted you know i had all the freedom in the world i was uh, i was a boxer so i felt like i was on top of the world untouchable uh, i was living life to max i was basically the it guy wherever i went you know i felt i was at my peak nothing could touch me and i would this is how it was going to be throughout now like i said in the beginning of this speech there is some news that some of us aren't or don't prepared they're not we're not prepared to hear or accept it and mine came to me in march 31st 2013 the news came to me like a speck of dust that wouldn't leave my eye or like a bad song that was playing on my head on repeat me and a couple of my friends were at a at a friend's house just another casual night as the night progressed we decided to take our bikes out for a ride something we would do very often i remember getting on my bike and riding off and at pace i remember entering this tunnel and while coming out of it this is one of my very last memory i have till date while getting out of it my bike hit a truck a stationary truck i lost control of my bike and my bike crashed into a concrete pillar of a shop my friends heard the sound and they came back just to find my body lying dead over there with this broken concrete wall on top of me i was rushed to the hospital the first hospital left me unattended in their lobby for 4 hours untreated and upon checking checking my vitals i had a count of 3 out of 15 that's called a gse count now what this means is i had a 3 out of 15 i was i barely had a pulse i barely had a heartbeat i was barely alive i was in coma for a week on the support of a ventilator and up, and uh, i was in the icu for about 2 weeks upon waking up i was told i had two major surgeries done on my body already the doctors explained i suffered 18 fractures on my skull three of my ribs were broken one piercing my lung and made a hole i had multiple fractures all over my body my face but the injury that changed my life was a spinal cord injury my spinal cord at my t5 t6 level was crushed i was basically paralyzed below my waist now it took me a couple of months or years rather to accept the fact that something like this could happen to me and uh, i was just hoping every day i was just waking up and it was a bad dream the next couple of months was spent in the rehabilitation teaching me how to move from a wheelchair to a car how to move from a wheelchair to a bed how to take a shower how to pick things from the ground literally i was taught all over again but you know what hurt me really most was that the people's attitudes and persp- and perspective about me changed my friends left almost every one of them people started looking at me with sympathy and they thought i was done and that i'm never going to recover from this they thought i was done my chapter is done and that's his life story they didn't, they didn't expect anything of me anymore and i was at home 24 hours a day but you know what being at home 24 hours a day i had something with me at that time which i never had before i had time time to think time to analyze time to think about my actions that i've done till date the consequences the people i've hurt the people i've loved the things i did for people that didn't matter to impress people that didn't care my entire life stopped and flashed back in front of me it was like a repeat questioning everything i've done till date was it worth it or wasn't friends used to call this was the single most biggest realization of my life by the way friends used to call it was more of a one sided conversation asking about my health and that was it you know every my entire life was questioned of uh, will i ever have a normal job again will i ever be a normal guy again will i uh, have a normal social circle again i was lost i was confused and i was unaware what to do next and you know at that time though in life everything stood against me something in me remained unchanged and that was the spark in me the fire the fire that had pushed me all these years to be who i was though everybody was 
coming against me, all the negativity was coming towards me. My only goal, my only vision, my only focus, my only determination was to prove these people wrong and that I am not limited by their thoughts of what's possible for me and what's not. I was determined to make it bigger and higher than most of, most of the people I knew. Their limitations on me pushed me to think beyond my imagination just and just to prove to them one thing only that I, Sujit, was still capable. You know, there's a saying, in life everything happens for a reason. A lie. I have loved and what I have made of and I still make of today is the truth that all of you see here today. My first step of picking myself up came when I was denied one very simple thing and that is sleeping in my own very room, in my house in Kerala. Thing is, my room is on the first floor and I, I'm on the ground floor and nobody could find a way to get this boy all the way upstairs. I asked, I asked, I insisted, I was denied over and over again until finally I had to rewire my mind to think of a way how to get upstairs without anybody's help. And I thought, I was so persistent that I wheeled myself to the end of the stair, I placed myself from the wheelchair to the stair and I physically lifted up my entire body with my hands 18 steps up and I reached the top floor. And you know, when I reached on top, I was exhausted, I was tired, I was sweaty, I was panting, I was, I was dead. But it was worth it. You know why? Because I suddenly did something what almost everybody considered impossible. And I did it by myself. From then on, uh, whatever I've done, whatever I've accomplished, so I started picking myself up. This was the very first boost that I got within myself, the fire lit back up again, saying that I could do something what people thought was impossible. And over the years, no matter whatever I've done, whatever I've accomplished, people always found a shortcoming in me because I was on a wheelchair. They always said he could do this, this, but he wouldn't be able to do that because that's way harder to him or for him. They said, no matter what he does, he always needs somebody with him because he's on a wheelchair. In 2017, I took a flight solo from, Bang from Charger all the way to Bangalore. I stayed in Bangalore for a week, had the best time with my friends, and I came back to base. The same people who told Sujit, that's never going to happen, that is not possible, suddenly came and asked me, how did you do it? From then on, it was just changing people's perspectives of what they thought about a person on a wheelchair. They told me I'll never have a decent job. I probably wouldn't get a job. Today, I work for Emirates NBD in the Treasury Department. They said my confidence and my spirit would be broken and that my voice is going to be shunned. Today, I'm a motivational speaker in the UAE. And just when they thought that I wouldn't get my body back, that I wouldn't get to be fit again, today I'm a fitness influencer in the UAE and an official fitness influencer for the Dubai Fitness Challenge. <laughs> this drive in me was just to prove people one thing and to show people one thing, that if you put your heart and your mind into the things that you want, anything is possible. And that very drive drove me last year to do something exceptional. And it had to be physical for people to see that it's done by a guy in a wheelchair. That's when I collaborated with Virgin Radio, Chris Fade Show. I collaborated with Chris. I, I ended up pulling a car that was tied to my body, a car that weighed 1,200 kilos for about 10 meters physically sitting on my wheelchair. Now, let me tell you, for a normal person to pull a car is hard, I agree. But if I asked you before you saw me, do you think a person in a wheelchair would do that much weight? Most of you would have said, that's not possible. And I did that only, not because of my physical strength, but because I was determined to do so. And that very determination pushed, that very determination got me winning the Masala Award 2017 for the most inspirational personality. Guys, I wouldn't let my story be used as a cautionary tale, but that of a learning for oneself to find their fire within that will help them to do things beyond their imagination. And let me tell you, look for it nowhere. Not outside, not on him, not on me, not on anybody, but within, within you, within yourself. All you gotta do is make the first move, take the first step. I found my fire, now it's time to find yours. I'm just gonna show you a small slides of my journey that I've been through all this while.
Like I say, guys, the fall may not be yours to blame, but the rise definitely is. Thank you. Next up, we, we have a ra rather interesting take on a notion that is normally disregarded as unhealthy or absurd. Please welcome Asan Tasi. Nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. These are the words of Eleanor Roosevelt. Good afternoon to everyone present here, and I'm Asan Tahsil. Now, before I go any further, I'd like you guys to take a look at the people behind me right now. Now, they are all immensely successful in their respective fields, but you know what's one thing they all have in common? It's their arrogance, it's their passion that they have for what the work they do, the energy they bring, the belief that they are the best no matter what anybody tells them. I mean, if you just look at it, we rarely go a Michael Jordan interview without him mentioning the fact that he has one, two, three, four, five, six rings, which of course is an incredible achievement. And let's not forget that Kanye West said that he knew he was the most influential p p person before Time Magazine put him on the cover of their 100 Most Influential Issue. And, well, you've definitely seen this one before, but Robert Downey Jr.'s Twitter bio simply states, you know who I am. Because, well, let's be honest, you know who he is. And Steve Jobs, well, he's a completely different case entirely. He's considered as one of the 21st century's most influential figures for a very good reason. He would never listen to other people's criticisms and he'd always push for his own ideas. He'd even ask his employees very difficult questions, which we can just call inappropriate for now, just to see how they'd react under pressure. And of course, we can rarely go a Cristiano Ronaldo interview without him telling us who he thinks is the greatest football player of all time. Now, I want to address the, the perception of arrogant people in today's society. Now, when kids are growing up, they're taught, don't be arrogant. Learn to put others above yourself. Now, I don't fundamentally disagree with these principles of modesty, but at the same time, I don't fundamentally agree with them either. I believe that arrogance is simply just a belief, it's just self-confidence. It's a belief in yourself. Arrogance is, I'm the best at what I do. Arrogance is, well, I believe I'm the best dressed person in this auditorium right now. And I'm not just saying that to make a point, I do believe that. On the other hand, narcissism is a lack of empathy and a need for admirement that sometimes stems from a mental, a mental disorder. And, well, narcissism never leads to anything good. Narcissism is when Robespierre would chop the head off of anyone who disagreed with him. But, like I said, it never leads to anything good. The next year, he lost his own head. And I learned that lesson thanks to my history teacher, Ms. Priyanka. <laughs> now, I'd like to talk about some of the advantages that, advantage, uh, that arrogant people have. First of all, sorry, it builds confidence. Now, it's said that the tiger never loses sleep over the opinion of the sheep. Now, this is a very good example of what arrogance can do for you. It always pushes that belief that, you know, what he can do, I can do better. And it keeps unwanted people at bay. It creates an invisible shield around you, so it's such that nobody takes advantage of you. And this, is, this, this means no disrespect to modest people, but they're always more likely to be taken advantage of. It helps in getting work done. Now, this may seem a little bit eccentric when I say that, but I do believe in it. And because then you can always focus on yourself, which is the last point, putting yourself above others, putting your own needs as your priority. And of course, I need to be a reliable host, so I, and I wouldn't be one if I didn't acknowledge that arrogance does have its weaknesses. They, people tend to belittle others, have short tempers, and will not, not really consider other people, but this is not the type of arrogance that, I, that I'm promoting here. I'm talking about arrogance in the sense that you are stubborn enough to take the big step and step out of your comfort zone when others would never dare to go there. Take a stand for yourself in, in areas where regular people would just shy away. In the words, in the words of Kanye West, now I can let these dream killers kill my self-esteem or use my arrogance as esteem to power my dreams. I use it as my gas so they say that I'm gas, but without it I'll be last so I ought to laugh. And I'd like to end on a quote from one of my favorite TV shows. Life is like this, but I like this. Thank you so much for being such a great audience. Amisha Girish is a grade 12 student who's a logophile and a bibliophile, who's in search of the great manifesto. I welcome her onto the stage. A couple of months back, I stumbled upon an inspirational quote that simply didn't let go of my mind. Despite many incessant thoughts, 
that I go through on a daily basis, this one stuck there. Now, based on the quote, I did a lot of research, and that led me to evolve, develop a bit of an elaborate analysis of the quote and a more of a detailed introspection in order to assimilate it. So here I am to present to you this introspection so you can have your own choice with that. I'm Amisha Girish, a grade 12 student of this wonderful school. This speech is about the inner self and hopefully it will change the way you think about yourself and it will enable you to position yourself in a different perspective. Okay, so now what is this quote that I seem to boast so much about? Are you ready to hear it? Okay, listen, it goes like this. Why sell for something good when you can turn it into something great? I repeat, why settle for something good when you can turn it into something great? Now, the aim of this talk is to help you to evolve from a good person to a great person. And in order to do that, I will introduce you to two terms that play an integral part in this whole session. One is self-actualization, and the other one is self-realization. Now, I know at the outset, these two terms seem really synonymous to each other. However, they represent two very different aspects. Self-actualization, on the one hand, is the process of asking yourself the question, have I utilized the best of my existing capabilities to the work that I have been assigned to do such that I produce the best results? Whereas self-realization, on the other hand, is the process of asking yourself the question, who am I? Now, given by the definitions, you will realize that there is a very thin line that differentiates the both. I think the former is pretty clear and clear to understand based on the definitions given by me, whereas a pretty simple and straightforward question of who am I does bring a bit of pose to the, uh, uh, does bring a bit of pose to the answer, doesn't it? I mean, I can casually say, I'm Amisha Girish, I'm X, I'm Y, and so on. I mean, I've known, my whole life, I've known that I'm Amisha. However, when you look at the self-realization philosophy, you will realize that the names that you have been given is a, unique te is a technique to uniquely differentiate one from another. It does not in any way reflect the real essence of the inner self. When you look at people who are great and who have achieved greatness, you will realize that all of them at one point in time have asked themselves the question, who am I? And obviously, they have settled for an answer that helped them to evolve from a good person to a great person. This is exactly why successful people successful and why great people are great. Now, since I mentioned the self a lot, let me explain a bit, a bit more about the self. Now, you can imagine the self as the subconscious mind or the power that controls your human body. It is the power that has recorded everything you've ever said or done. It is also the power that helps you to perceive the environment from your five basic senses. Now, just like the self, in a nutshell, the self is what makes every single human being the same because this inner self, which is there in me, is also there in you and is there in every single human being. However, the self is also the reason why we all are unique. Contradicting, isn't it? No. Let us clear this contradiction and establish how we can nurture the self from good to great. Now, I know that every single human being in this world experiences different kinds of emotions on a daily basis. For example, I wake up happy, but I go to school 
And depending on the events that take place in school, I can either be sad, I can be disappointed, 